Hey folks, welcome back. You know, I'm Monkey. We all are when you really think about it. You ever think back to the early stages of man where we were all just feral apes who had nothing more to worry about than who had the biggest rock or whose big rock could smash other people's rocks? It was a good time. Although I guess it is pretty nice that I don't have to hunt for food. These days I can just go down to my local grocery store and buy an oven bakeable pizza pie for seven dollars. Can you believe that? Why is shit so expensive these days? I love me a good primate. Look, it's not always easy to pan these videos out so they're at least 10 minutes long, okay? Give me a break. I love them though, man. They're like stupid little much more dangerous humans. Check this shit out. This dude throws an orangutan a mango or whatever, and then... Hell yeah, dude. Look, maybe I don't want to be talking about video games all the time, okay? Maybe I just want to make a video about apes. Give me a break. All right, who am I kidding? The only thing I have any kind of knowledge about is video games. Donkey Kong. He's an ape. Everybody knows about Donkey Kong, man. He's one of the oldest and most iconic video game characters of all time. This big stupid ape, of course, started out as the antagonist of, uh... I don't remember what the game was called, but it was good. It was Nintendo's first real success in the video game industry. People apparently loved jumping over barrels in the early 80s. But as the video game industry became more and more profitable and the focus went from arcade cabinets to home consoles, Nintendo kind of neglected the ape in favor of the little Italian man jumping over the barrels. However, in the mid 90s, along came a little English development company called Rareware. Impressed by Rare's ability to tell the Super Nintendo and its technical limitations to go f itself and make games that wouldn't look out of place on the Nintendo Nintendo 64, Nintendo purchased a large amount of Rare's assets and enlisted them as a second party developer. This eight year partnership resulted in an absurd amount of absolute classics, like the Killer Instinct series, GoldenEye 007, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and of course, Banjo Kazooie. However, it all started with one game released in 1994 on the Super Nintendo. Donkey Kong Country. I had a Super Nintendo as a kid, and Donkey Kong Country was one of my favorite games. And as I've gotten older, I always find myself gravitating back to this game. And it's got a couple of pretty neat sequels as well. So let's stop monkeying around and look at the Donkey Kong Country trilogy on the Super Nintendo. Donkey Kong Country, titled Super Donkey Kong in Japan, was released on the Super Nintendo in 1994 and served as a complete reboot of the Donkey Kong franchise. It's a whole new world with all new characters. The only real connection to the old Donkey Kong arcade games are barrels and swinging on ropes and vines. They're subtle little homages without dwelling too much on the past. It's nice. But anyway, Donkey's got a whole new design. Rare has him looking much more like a silverback gorilla than before. And he's even got a little tie. How cute is that? This is the design that would go on to be the official look of Donkey Kong from then on. This gorilla doesn't f with any of that business casual nonsense these days. There's also a whole DK crew. Cranky Kong is a grumpy old man who is more often than not disappointed in you, and he's generally believed to be the Donkey Kong from the arcade game. If you go into his cabin in the game, he'll drop some hints and make some funny fourth wall breaking jokes about how much you suck ass at this game. Funky Kong is Donkey Kong's brother or something, I don't know, but he'll let you hop into his plane barrel and let you travel through all the different worlds. This is the only way that you can actually travel from world to world. And then there's Candy Kong, who lets you save your game. I don't really, I don't really want to talk about Candy Kong anymore. And then of course there's one final Kong. You thought I forgot, didn't you? I could never forget my boy. Diddy Kong, baby, hell yeah, monkey time. Rare wanted to give Donkey Kong a little buddy and so they came up with Diddy Kong and just, He's perfect. He immediately became a favorite Nintendo character. Fun fact about Diddy Kong, he was actually the first Super Smash Bros. character to be made by a non-Japanese person. Since he was made by the British, wouldn't he? Cheeky little monkey, innit? So yeah, there's actually two playable characters in this game, which would go on to be the standard in all the Donkey Kong Country games. They basically work as hit points as well. If you come across a DK barrel, you can throw it and out will come Diddy Kong or Donkey Kong. They also play differently. Donkey Kong is slower and he can't jump as high, but there's certain characters who only he can kill by jumping on top of. And he also automatically kills armadillos while they're rolling, while Diddy will bounce off them and have to jump on them again. Donkey Kong can also do this ground slap thing that hurts enemies and reveals bananas. Diddy Kong on the other hand is much faster and can jump higher. And also while Donkey Kong does a little somersault, Diddy does a cartwheel. They can both kill enemies by running into them with the roll or the cartwheel, but Diddy Kong's cartwheel is a lot faster and a lot more easy to use than Donkey Kong's roll. And also you can do a cartwheel with Diddy off of ledges and jump midair, which is actually required for getting certain items. Donkey Kong can do the roll jump thing too, but it's a lot easier with Diddy. Also, if you start rolling into enemies, you'll gain momentum and keep rolling. Diddy is generally the better character to play as. The benefits of playing as Donkey Kong don't really outweigh how much faster and more agile Diddy is. You can switch back and forth between the two of them at any time by 
pressing select. And you can also play the entire game all the way through in a cooperative two-player mode, where one plays as Donkey Kong and the other plays as Diddy Kong. In my opinion, this is one of the most fun Super Nintendo co-op games. If one of you dies, the other one takes over. And it can be kind of stressful, but it's still fun, you know? It's a video game, it's still fun. Other than the Kongs, we got Animal Buddies. Cause you know, gorillas are very well known for their ability to be friends with other animals. We got Rambi the rhinoceros who can dash and smash through walls. Expresso the ostrich who can kind of fly and can also run really fast. And he has really cool sneakers. How 90s is that? Winky the frog who's a fucking nightmare to control. And Unguard the swordfish who you can ride around the water levels. And he can attack enemies which is pretty cool. Now I know jumping around as monkeys is a lot of fun, but what's my motivation? All the bananas are gone. Good enough for me. So yeah, now that Donkey Kong is officially a good guy, obviously Rare had to make a villain, right? And of course, they chose none other than the natural mortal enemy of the gorilla. The owl, the, the crocodile. I guess in theory, any animal is the natural mortal enemy of a gorilla since they're vicious, angry, territorial monsters. But anyway, the main villain here is of course King K. Rule and his crew of Kremlings, a species of really jacked humanoid crocodiles. Although the villains aren't just crocodiles, there's all kinds of animals that want to kill the Kongs. You got bees, beavers, armadillos, emus, race traders. Obviously one of the most appealing things about this game for a lot of people are the graphics. Unlike most Super Nintendo games which use sprites, Donkey Kong Country uses fully 3D rendered models, and as a result, the visuals on this game are just unreal. I don't think it's a far stretch to say it's one of the best looking Super Nintendo games. On top of the visuals though, the music is just... Oh my god, man. Rare has always been known for their absolute banger soundtracks, and this game is certainly not an exception. David Wise just... The man's a fucking genius, bro. They don't call him wise for nothing, you know what I'm saying? Everybody loves aquatic ambience and jungle hijinks, and for good reason. But I think my favorite song on the soundtrack is Fear Factory. Like, just listen to that shit, dude. And that's Donkey Kong Country, baby. It's one of my favorite Super Nintendo games. But don't get too excited, I'm not done talking. The bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you. You see, Donkey Kong Country made a lot of money. What do you think, Nintendo's not gonna take an opportunity to make more money? They love making money. They've been making video games since the 1800s. I don't even think video games existed back then. That's right, the success of Donkey Kong Country led to not one, but two sequels on the Super Nintendo. That's a lot of monkey. Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. Because this game was made by English people, so everything has to be fucking hilarious. After their failed attempt at stealing bananas, the Kremlings have made the logical next step in being naughty, that being kidnapping. So yeah, King K. Rule, now dressing like a pirate and going by Captain K. Rule, he's going through a phase, don't worry about it, is holding Donkey Kong captive, so it's up to Diddy Kong to save the day this time. But not to worry, Diddy has a friend to accompany him in the form of Dixie Kong. Finally, a female character who isn't fucking horrifying. Dixie Kong gets a lot of flack from fans, and I don't really get why. I think she's a cutie. She's got a little pink shirt with a knot tied in the front and a matching pink hat. She's even got earrings. What a fashionable little monkey. And she's even got a giant ponytail that looks like a banana. Like, come on, she's adorable. Just like the first game, we have two playable characters. But since Donkey Kong is being held hostage by a terrorist organization, Dixie is taking his place. She's kind of like a hybrid between Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong in terms of her movement. She's a little slower than Diddy and can't jump quite as high, but she can also do this hair helicopter thing where she glides a little bit. I guess really the only thing she has in common with Donkey Kong is the fact that she holds barrels and stuff above her head. I would say that overall, I like this game best in terms of the playable characters. Diddy and Dixie are both small, agile, and fast. I genuinely feel like it's worthwhile to use both characters. In the first game, I feel like I pretty much exclusively play as Diddy Kong if I have the option. I think the general consensus is that Diddy is the better character here. I know a lot of speedrunners swear by him, but Dixie Kong feels pretty on par. She's especially useful for getting secrets. I think Rare did a really good job of making a sequel that retains a lot of elements from the original game, but is also different enough to stand on its own. It's a lot less realistic than the first one, which might turn people off, but I really like it. I think Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2 really have distinctive vibes. The first game has this sort of realistic, jungly atmosphere, whereas the second game goes for more of a cartoony aesthetic. Also, it's very pirate-themed. 
Who doesn't love pirates? All the enemies are dressed up like pirates. The Kremlings now have peg legs. These guys have big cannons and pirate hats. A lot of enemies have bandanas. A lot of the music has this sort of swashbuckling sea shanty vibe to it. I love it. On that note, the music is obviously amazing again. David Wise is back at it, boys. There is, of course, everyone's favorite song, Sticker Brush Symphony, which is beautiful and straight up mind-blowing for the Super Nintendo. But I think my favorite track is probably Forest Interlude another gorgeous, soothing piece of music. Honestly, when it comes to visuals, I don't really think I prefer either game. I think they're both great. I love the first game's jungle vibe with the realistic graphics, but I also love the second game's cartoony design. And I don't know about you, but I'm a sucker for pirates, so it's a shoe in for me. That said, I think the second game is a little bit more creative in some ways than the first one. Like one kind of lame thing about DKC1 is the fact that all the bosses are just giant versions of the regular enemies. And you always fight them in the same level, a giant banana, room, whereas the bosses in DKC2 are a lot more creative. You fight them in different areas and you have to do different things to defeat them. On the other hand, this game is really fucking hard. Like the first game was difficult, but damn bro, this game is tough as nails, especially later on. Like the fucking bramble levels, man. Jesus Christ. I think if they didn't have Sticker Brush Symphony playing during these levels, Rare would have been the victim of a lot more instances of their buildings getting egged. Then there's the water levels and the levels with the wind. On top of that, you have to pay with a consumable to save your game. You collect these banana coins throughout the game and it costs two of them to save your game at the Kong College. Resident Evil thought they were clever making you use an ink ribbon to save. Donkey Kong Country 2 is like, oh, sorry, you've only got one coin? That's a shame, because I don't speak broke. This is pretty brutal, especially considering how challenging this game is. Sure, it's free the first time you do it, but I could definitely see kids having a hard time getting coins to save their game before bosses and stuff. And look, I think it's good for kids to play challenging games, but like, oh my god, man, give them a break. They're only babies, they just finished their math homework, they just wanna have some fun. Like, why did it have to be two coins? Was one not good enough? But that's really a single issue. Overall, Donkey Kong Country 2 is an amazing game with banger tunes, and cartoony yet stylized graphics. I think Donkey Kong Country 1 is a little bit more nostalgic for me, but overall I would say that the second one is the better game. Basically, if I had to pick a favorite, my heart would say this one, but my brain would say this one. And then they made a third one. Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Triple Trouble. King K. Rool is back at it again, this time masquerading as Baron K. Rulenstein. And he's kidnapped not just Donkey Kong, but also Diddy Kong. So yeah, we've totally foregone the original Kongs, and now we get a game with Dixie Kong as the featuring star. And good for her. She's broken through that glass ceiling and earned her own starring role. You'll love to see it. But of course, as is the case with every game, she needs a tag team partner. So she goes to Funky Kong and he provides her with Kitty Kong. So there we go, folks. The first shitty Donkey Kong Country character. It's happened. I'm not taking a bold stance, right? Everybody hates Kitty Kong. It's amazing how humans have a mechanism in their brain to find babies cute so that they protect them. And yet the overwhelming consensus on Kitty Kong is, Hey babe, look what I got. Ew. Oh, ew, ew. Why would you show me that? That's disgusting. Like for real, when an enemy hits Dixie Kong, she falls on the ground and cries and I feel empathy for her. But when Kitty Kong gets hit and he just screams, all I can think is, good. This is how it should be. Yeah, not a fan of this. Have you figured that out? Have you picked that up? Have I, have I gotten that across? So yeah, we're back to the one big character and one small character dynamic from Donkey Kong Country 1. Kitty Kong is distinct from Donkey Kong though. He can't do the ground drum thing that his uncle or whatever can do. But he is heavier and stronger than Dixie. He can break through certain doors on the floor and can defeat bigger enemies that Dixie can't. Much like DKC2, the characters can pick up and throw each other, which is important for collecting extras and stuff. Kitty Kong can throw Dixie up and diagonally, which is nice because when Dixie lands on a platform, Kitty Kong just kind of One actually super cool thing they added in this game was that if Dixie Kong throws Kitty against a wall, he'll roll back and you can ride on top of him like you can with steel drums in the other games. I always liked the idea of riding on top of the steel drum, but you so infrequently get to do it in the previous games and it can be really hard to set up. So it's cool that you can basically do it any time as long as you have both characters alive. Now here's the thing, a lot of people really rip into this game and I think that's kind of unfair. It's not even close to a bad game. It's fun, it's stylized, and it has a 
fair share of new ideas. You gotta give Rare credit. Considering they made each of these games within a year of each other, they managed to make three wholly unique games. Like sure, there's a lot of reused assets and stuff, but they really went out of their way to make each game distinct from one another. Like there are sections where you play as this elephant who shoots water out of his trunk. And also he's afraid of mice, so you gotta throw barrels at them, which is cute. And there's also water levels where you have this little fish following behind you, and you gotta keep feeding him fish so that he doesn't attack you, which is super creative. I think a lot of the flack that this game gets stems from the fact that the first two games were such absolute masterpieces. Like, I mean, it had a lot to live up to. It doesn't really feel right to say that it's the worst game of the three, because I like them all. I guess I'll just say that it's the least goodest. Yeah, I don't know. It's good, but it's missing a lot of the charm from the first two games. The worlds aren't nearly as memorable as the first two. The visuals of the levels are beautiful, sure, but I don't know, there's something about these levels that just don't quite feel as relatable or atmospheric as the first two games, especially in comparison to Diddy's Conquest. And there's also the music, which is just honestly kind of bad for the most part. And like I said, the first two games had music that was in a league of its own in terms of Super Nintendo soundtracks. The bar was set pretty high. <laughs> Get it? Bar? It's like a music joke. But the soundtrack is generally forgettable at best and straight up bad at worst. There's a few decent tracks for sure, but like listen to the music that plays in the first level. Like, are you serious with this? It's weird too, because sure, David Wise wasn't the lead composer, but he was still involved. And the person who handled the majority of the music was far from inexperienced. She was involved in the composition of the last two games. I've heard far worse soundtracks, but if you're big into video game music, and especially if you're a fan of the first two game soundtracks, you're not even gonna be close to blown away here. Overall, I would not even come close to saying that this is a bad game. It's a lot of fun, and I would recommend it to anybody who likes platformers. It just doesn't quite live up to its predecessors. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with being third best. I've never ranked that high in any aspect of my life. And that's the whole gosh dang Donkey Kong Country trilogy. Except for the new ones, but you know what I mean. Overall, it's a great series of games. Some of my favorites of all time, in fact. If you're a fan of video games and or primates, you're sure to have a good time here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some monkey business to attend to. Not every joke can be a winner, you know?